I'm delighted to be here to talk about um, the Institute to Transform Child Protection at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota, and the work that we're doing um, on system-wide policy reform in the area of child welfare, in particular, uh, parent representation. Um, the goal of the presentation today is to talk to you a little bit about our institute and how I, as a parent attorney, got involved with policy work, but more importantly, to allow you to meet um, a couple of the partners that I work with on policy work and um, real policy leaders in, in Minnesota. Um, and so I just want to take a minute now and have our other presenters um, introduce themselves uh, briefly before we jump into the full presentation. Um, so I'm Joanna Woolman, and I'm a professor of law and director of the Institute to Transform Child Protection at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, where we have a um, an institute, but a part of that is a, a family defense clinic where we have a holistic interdisciplinary um, representation of parents. We also do training and policy reform work. Um, Representative Moran, do you want to go and then Max? Oh, you're muted. Thank you, Joanna. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rena Moran. I'm a state representative from St. Paul, Minnesota, representing District 65A here in St. Paul, and excited and honored to be here today. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Max Page. I'm an assistant county attorney in the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. Uh, the Hennepin County Attorney's Office is the largest public law office in the state of Minnesota. Um, I am a child protection uh, trial attorney uh, during um, my normal day job, but I also am the legislative liaison uh, for the County Attorney's Office um, during the legislative uh, session. Thanks, Max. I can't see you. I don't know if you're able to turn your camera on. I believe I see myself. My camera is on. I can also see him, John. Great. I just yeah. can't see Max. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> um, just completely going blind. That's great. Um, so uh, I'm just going to start out today talking a little bit about the Institute and some of the policy work that we've done, how we got involved in this before um, we hear a little bit about the specific bill that um, Representative Moran, um, Max, and I have been working on. So the Institute to Transform Child Protection is located at the law school. And as I indicated before, we focus on policy, research, training, community engagement, and um, we have a law clinic as well. Um, I have been a part of the Institute. Um, the Institute actually originated about 12 years ago, 11 years ago, um, right after parent representation in Minnesota shifted. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because we introduced a bill this year working on parent representation. Um, when I started out, I just ran the law clinic and over the last 10 years, we've really grown to include and, and sort of <laughs> get more people to come and, and work at the Institute. And um, over the last three to four years, um, I've gotten really personally interested in policy work. And I would say the real evolution for me personally, and then, taking our institute in the direction of handling more policy reform um, were really issues that we were seeing on individual cases and my desire to address those issues from a systemic perspective. Um, I came to uh, the law school after working at the public defender's office in Minnesota. And when I worked there, we handled criminal cases and parent representation cases. And I was so aware in that role as a public defender of how really not solving the systemic problems um, just leaves individuals stuck in the same um, sort of turnaround system. And so I was really committed to trying to address things on a macro level. And it, it took me a while to sort of uh, get to the point where I felt like I had um, the ability basically to do that. Um, so I would say that the, the quick answer to how I got involved in policy and the bill that we're going to talk about in this um, is I just started getting basically hundreds of phone calls a year from relatives in Minnesota who couldn't get licensed for foster care. Um, they were running into criminal background check problems with very minor offenses. And I think the call that took it over the edge for me was a grandmother who called, she'd been the primary caregiver for her um, seven-year-old grandson for almost his entire life. His mom struggled um, with uh, addiction and chemical dependency issues. and 
during one week. So grandma like took him to school. He lived with her. She took him to all his medical appointments. One weekend he was home visiting mom. He was removed from mom's care. They had never officially changed custody. He was removed in a child protection case and grandmother had a, uh, her biological son living at home. So grandson's uncle who was 17 and had a misdemeanor theft conviction. And that was creating a barrier for grandmother to be licensed to provide foster care for her grandson whom 24 hours later, everyone in the world had thought was a perfectly good home and accepted her with no questions asked. And so that sort of example really kind of flipped me out and took me over the edge and made me think like, we have to do something about this problem because this is nonsensical. This is not good for this family. This is not good for children. Um, so another issue that we have really become involved with um, that I'm gonna talk a little bit about is um, Minnesota's parent representation statute. and. Um, our institute and the original clinic was formed originally by a former Supreme Court Justice in Minnesota, Helen Meyer, who was very concerned about parent representation in Minnesota. And so that's been an issue that we've long been working on. So my goal today is to talk first a little bit about the parent representation bill and then let um, Max and Representative Moran join in when we talk a little bit about the foster care licensing bill that we've been working on. And just for your information, there's files uh, attached that have our like information about the bills, links to the bills. Um, so if you want to take a look at those while I'm talking, please feel free to do that as well. Um, one of the things I learned um, early on is that it was really important to build partnerships when I started thinking about reform. And I have to admit that this was something that was extremely challenging for me. Um, the two partners that I have here today, I think, are examples of what I indicate on this slide is something that I have really found to be critical for anybody who is seeking to do policy reform work as a parent attorney. Um, one, I think it's really important to find unlikely partners. And I don't know if Max would agree with this, but I would say that the work that we do with um, the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, um, I would not have predicted or imagined but on the work on the foster care licensing bill, they have been an invaluable partner. Um, and Max can talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then I also think that one thing I know about our, our state legislature is that in order to make meaningful policy change, you really need legislative leaders and champions. And I could not think of a better example of that in the arena of child welfare than representative Rena Moran, and she'll have a chance to tell you more about that work. Um, there's been a lot of roadblocks and lessons learned. There's been a lot of partnerships that haven't worked. There's been a lot of um, hitting walls and having to regroup. Um, the bill that I'm going to talk about first, the parent representation bill, this is the second year we've worked on it. Um, the foster care licensing bill is coming back for its fourth year. So it does also take quite a bit of time and persistence. Um, so I just wanted to give you a sense on this slide of our current and emerging reform efforts at the Institute. And the two we're gonna talk about today um, are our parent representation bill and our foster care licensing standards. Um, the other things on this list are issues that I'd be happy to answer questions about later, but they're sort of emerging issues in our state that we're looking at. So parent representation in Minnesota. Um, I'm just gonna do a crash course in Minnesota. So Minnesota is one of eight states in the country that doesn't mandate counsel for parents. We have a discretionary statute right now, and the language of this statute in its current form is on the left of this. It includes this really bizarre language that says that um, the court shall appoint counsel in a case where it feels that such appointment would be appropriate. Um, super weird, feels it's appropriate is like very confusing. Um, and we are proposing language in Minnesota that would mandate the appointment of counsel for all indigent parents starting at the initial hearing for the entirety of the case. Um, and this evolution in practice in Minnesota has, from my perspective, been a long time coming, but it's been a long road to get there. Um, prior to 2009 in Minnesota, the statewide public defender system provided um, and paid for representation of all indigent parents in child welfare. Um, hearings. And this was a statewide salaried system where all parents had an attorney at the removal hearing. In 2009, the state public defender's office filed a lawsuit against the counties and basically said, we don't have to do this. We're not mandated to do this. There's no constitutional or statutory right in Minnesota that requires us to do this. And so that case went up to the Minnesota Supreme Court. And starting in 2009, the court agreed, the Minnesota Supreme Court, 
with the state public defender's office and the representation of parents at that point fell directly to each individual county. Um, so this was a massive change in practice um, and it resulted in huge inconsistency in the quality of practice and also inconsistency in whether individuals actually got attorneys. Um, we don't have accurate data in Minnesota, but anecdotal data suggests that at least 40% of parents in Minnesota were not um, getting representation at the emergency protective care hearing after that change in 2009. So needless to say, from a, from a family defense and parent advocacy perspective, this was a huge problem. Um, so just to visualize, we had a consistent system. Today, we have a system that does 87 different things. There's no mandated contracts. There's no mandated um, set amount of pay or caseload limits. Each county is paying individuals um, to do this and has their own sort of system set up. Um, so we began several years ago working on a bill to mandate um, the right to counsel for parents in child welfare cases. And I'm happy to say that um, that bill now is, <laughs> we're, we're still alive this session. Um, it's gotten a ton of support. Um, and I'm very hopeful that that bill will be passed. Um, and I'd be happy to answer some questions later about that bill. I wanted to make sure that I included talking about this because I do think that for those of you who are parent representatives and are interested in improving your appointment statute or improving the way that parent representation is done in your state, um, I think a bill like we put together is, is possible. And um, I would be happy to talk more specifically with anybody who has ideas about how they wanna do this. Um, okay, so that's the parent representation bill. Um, the next legislative effort that I'd like to talk about is our foster care licensing statutes and um, sorry, standards. So there's a slide here. And I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Max to talk a little bit about the licensing standards system in Minnesota. Um, and then we'll open it up to Representative Moran and Max to talk a little bit about their work on this bill and their work more generally. Max? I know. Um... Just going to try to give a quick overview here of what foster care licensing looks like in Minnesota. Um, like uh, all, if not most states, uh, Minnesota has a system of background checks um, that are done uh, before uh, individuals can be licensed for foster care. And that's whether they're relatives or whether they're just a random person from the community who wants to provide foster care. Um, in Minnesota, there are uh, each count, each eighty, each of the eighty-seven counties has um, social workers who uh, do the licensing work and make a recommendation uh, to the state Department of Human Services for um, whether this family or this home should be given a foster care license. Um, then the state Department of Human Services, you know, is the one that grants the license. Um, it's worth noting that, and this is probably true in a lot of your jurisdictions, um, in the metro and urban areas, there are specialized licensing social workers um, that are separate from investigators or field uh, social workers. And then in more rural areas, you might only have one or two social workers who are doing everything. They're doing licensing, uh, they're doing field case management, they're doing investigations. Um, the the uh, statutes in Minnesota lay out four different uh, categories of um, crimes that need to be considered when someone's trying to get a license for a foster uh, for a foster home. Um, the social workers are required to look not only at criminal convictions but also even criminal charges. Um, those also count, uh, and that. That is an important thing to remember as we get into some of these lower level crimes that I'm about to talk about. So for, there's four, uh, really quickly, there's four levels of crimes. Um, there are uh, per certain crimes that are permanent disqualifications. You can't ever have a foster care license. These are your murder, uh, you know, assault in the first degree with great bodily harm, criminal sexual conduct, kidnapping. It's your Adam Walsh um, statutes, essentially. Um, felony, um, you know, neglect of a child or malicious punishment of a child. 
There's another category lower than that, that uh, if you've got a conviction or even a charge, you're disqualified for 15 years. These are felony um, assaults, robberies, terroristic threats, Below that, there's a 10-year disqualification period for gross, mister, gross misdemeanor um, convictions, um, domestic assaults, uh, check forgery, that kind of thing. And then a seven-year disqualification period for misdemeanor level convictions for some of those crimes that I've talked about. Now, except for the permanent uh, disqualificating, disqualification crimes, you can also get what's called a set-aside or a variance. And in a set-aside, a, the Department of Human Services will just look past the uh, criminal conviction and in a, set, in a variance, um, there's a time limited uh, time where they will uh, ignore that. It's a complex system that is used to uh, license not only foster homes, but anything else that um, you need a, a state background study for. So if you're going to go work in a hospital or something like that, um, you know, you have to have this singular statewide background study. Um, the, the issue that we have wound up facing with these uh, statutes is that they're not child focused and they're completely misaligned with our state adoption standards. Um, so what we've run into is we have individuals who, um, you know, don't have any disqualifying crimes under our adoption statutes, but we can place, cannot place those children into those homes because there's some other, um, criminal uh, charge or conviction. I'll give a couple of examples. Um, in Minnesota, marijuana remains illegal. And a sale of any amount of marijuana is a felony. And so if someone sells a couple of joints to their friends, that's a felony uh, drug conviction. And that means they're disqualified for 15 years uh, from being a foster home. Um, that's true even, again, if it's just a charge and it's dismissed as some sort of diversion program or something um, that still prevents a what could be a very safe person, a good parent, um, from having a foster care license. Um, or the state of hockey, if, you know, a couple parents get into a little uh, tussle at a, you know, a hockey game, at their kid's hockey game, and they get a misdemeanor level assault conviction, that prevents or charge that prevents them from uh, being a, a foster parent for seven years. And um, that leads to some really unfortunate situations. Um, you can apply for those set asides and variances, but my, our experience has been um, the more paperwork, the more bureaucratic friction that you make potential foster parents need to engage in, the less likely they are to go through with the entire process. They, they oftentimes just say, no, thank you. Um, it leads to one of two results. Uh, one, a court will place a child with a relative, um, you know, who has one of these convictions, and then that relative doesn't get uh, funding, so, you know, foster care uh, funding. The other result is a child's placed out, outside of um, the family structure and not in a, a non-relative home. And in both of those situations, you know, that's a less than ideal result. Uh, really importantly, um, it's important to note, you know, anytime we have these conversations, I think, uh, to point out the the, race, the disparate racial impacts um, that our criminal justice system has on uh, people of color. And I don't need to cite any statistics at this point. I think we can all just stipulate that that is the case. And it's true about our child protection system. And when you have a foster care licensing system based on a criminal justice system. It just compounds the problem and it uh, makes it harder to keep families of color together. Um, I just want to note um, in Hennepin County where I work, um, you know, this is something we've started to try to take really seriously. As, as recently as 2017, we only had about 30%, uh, a little more than 30% of children who were placed out of the home placed with relatives. Um, we've spent a lot of money uh, and time and training investing uh, in kinship efforts, relative search efforts, and we've been able to um, double that. Um, we're almost at 70% now of children placed with relatives, and um, I'm, we're hoping if this bill uh, is passed that we'll be able to, to get that percentage even higher. Um, 
that is a really quick overview of an area of law that I'm not a complete expert in. We actually have a separate attorney in our office that handles licensing issues. It's not my area of expertise, but um, I am happy to answer questions in the chat if, if they do pop up. Thanks, Max. Um, so I guess now um, I'd like to, to hear from um, Representative Moran and Max a little bit about um, your work on this bill and then maybe your work more generally around policy reform um, and some of the partnerships that you've been able to establish um, in Minnesota. And then I want to make sure we leave some time at the end for questions about any of this. Representative Moran, do you want to talk a little? Yeah, uh, I would. Um, so I just want to thank everyone who decided to participate in this part of, of your conference, because I, I think looking at parent representation and looking at reforming um, our child protection system is really critical to really creating strong families and healthy individuals. So um, I want to share a little bit about me. Uh, I have been a state legislator now for six term. I'm in my 11th year as a state legislator. Um, I am someone who um, who believed that you know I never grew up to, to that little girl who wanted to be a politician, but believed through some experience politics found me. Uh, but I do believe that policies, laws, and practices really do Im impact communities back out across the state of Minnesota. And our child protection system is a system that has really impacted families. Um, some um, you may hear in some ways it's good, but often you hear uh, how we need to improve it. And so uh, a little bit of, uh, so that's a little bit about me as a state legislator, but I'm also a mother. I'm a mother of seven children myself. I have four sons and three daughters. And I remember I have my oldest son when he was in high school. He had one of his best friends who played basketball with him, who was, um, you know, he had foster parents. And um, I remember they were seniors in high school. He was in his last year uh, uh, of high school. Um, they was in like the, the last few weeks before graduation. You know, he was, uh, the young man was over my house. He had spent like a weekend just, you know, celebrating games and activities. Uh, I remember him calling his foster mother and, and, and saying, you know, is it okay if I stay with one of my friends over the night, which was my house, you know, we, we spoke and it was okay. And then Monday happened. And he went back to the house and for whatever reason, that foster mother was upset because there was uh, she had younger, her own children in the household. And she felt as if he were not setting a good example for her son. And she said to him, um, I can't do this no more. You know, I'm done. I'm not going to be a foster parent, whatever. You know, you need to go back. And I thought to myself, I was like, go back. And I also thought he's in his senior year of high school. The one of the most important times in his life, which can really impact his future. And that has been disrupted by her saying to him, you cannot come back to my house. And I stepped in and, and um, you know, I stepped in and said, I could be a foster parent. I could be a foster parent. And today he was 19. Today, I think he's like 34 two or 33 and he's still my son today you know we have a relationship but from that experience i just you know it just did not sit right for me so i had that experience later on i found myself uh working for an organization called prevent child abuse minnesota doing business as minnesota communities caring for children and i was brought in to create a parent leadership team that was parents who've been imp impacted by the child welfare system, out of home placement, foster care. So parents who may have been removed from their homes, parents who may themselves have been foster parents, uh, parents who may have been reunited with their kids and maybe not, maybe they lost their kids. But it was to bring parents together to work in partnership with the Department of Human Services to look at policies through a strength-based lens that will, can support parents and their children, right? Because a big part of our child welfare system 
is done through a deficit type of system. Bad parents, we're going to come in, we're going to take the kids and we're going to save them. And we're going to think that government is going to be able to raise these kids in a good way where they're going to grow up to be healthy and fine. And, um, and so for 10 years, I worked for this organization, just organizing the statewide team of parents to bring their voices together, to bring their voices to the table, to look at solutions and work in partnership with DHS about how we can improve a system that is been, that is done through, again, a strength-based lens. For example, what is a strength-based lens? So what, what, what is a deficit-based lens? So in our child welfare system, you know, you may have a report of a, a, a child who may be dirty, who may be coming to school smelling, who a teacher or someone from the community may be thinking that the child is not being provided for in the best way possible. They make a report, child protection shows up at the door, they go into the house, so maybe the house is not clean, they go to the refrigerator, look in the refrigerator, maybe there's not food in the refrigerator, and they're small kids, and they're wondering why there's not milk in the refrigerator for the baby, and they say, this is not a safe place for these kids to be, and they remove the kids deficit base. A strength based system would be for that child protection worker who go into that house and see the kids and see that it's not clean, see there's no food in the refrigerator. And they may ask questions about, you know, did you go shopping? You know, do you and you know, a mother say, well, my refrigerator is not working. So every day I get up in the morning, I go to the store and I buy food and I buy milk for my kids. Right. Or they may say, well, it's been it's been tough for me. You know, and so, I, you know, I have little kids. I haven't had a chance to clean up. And so what a strength based system would do is that that child protection worker would find services. Right. And they would say, oh, you need a new refrigerator. Well, we got money set aside because the state has set aside dollars that's going to support parents where they can go and they can buy a refrigerator. Right. Or they would at some point we had what we call a respite care where when parents was inundated and they felt heavy, that they can use respite care and take their child and go you know, for the weekend while they get the chance to recoup, get themselves together. Because being a parent is not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. For my, I'm, I have a mother of seven kids. It's not easy, right? So that is a strength-based system where we give the family the support they need because we know and research has showed us and tell us that removing a child from their home has the impact of trauma as someone losing a limb. That's the impact of removing a child from a home, right? That's the impact it has, has, right? And so if we think about children and doing the best on behalf of the children, we wanna make sure that we are, are minimizing the trauma and the impact that removal is having. And if we do need to remove it, this is the work I did as a nonprofit, right? That we are finding family members who can come in and also support that child, right? Instead of placing children with strangers, you know, someone they never know. In the middle of the night, they leave home with nothing but just a new place to be. And we know the impact of that, right? The kids show up in schools, they, they are, you know, they've been disrupted, they're sad, and they begin to act out. Now they're funneled into a into a special ed classroom. They have been suspended. They're funneled into a system, right? Because we as a state and as individual believe that we're doing what we need to do in the best interest of that child. We don't see or take the time to see the humanity in what we're doing. If I was removed from my home or you were removed from your home without knowing where you're going in place with strangers, how would you feel? What would you think? Would you believe that you are loved? And so that's a strength-based system that we're looking at and utilizing it. And so Lord behold, I became a state legislator, right? And these experiences that I've had and these experiences that I'm having and conversations that I'm having with parents from across the state of Minnesota, these are black parents, these are white parents, these are urban parents, these are rural parents, these are mothers, these are fathers. All these narratives are different, but there were some commonalities that I continue to hear from parents, right? And so we talk about partners. So for me, in order to do this work, and to look at a system that we can continue to improve and hold accountable and bring people together 
on behalf of children that we are removing from families, we have to have partners. So for me, as a state legislator, I try not to do anything um, just based on my own experience, but look to others. So it is the relationship that I found with Will Mitchell Law School and, jo and, jo and Joanna Woodman. It's the relationships that I found and have with parents from across the state of Minnesota that helps inform me about what do legislation needs to look like? What should we do? And what can we do? And how can you be a part of bringing your voices and your decision making to the table to help me, to help us as legislators who are creating laws that's going to have an impact? So I don't know if any of you remember back in 13, 14 with this young boy, his name was Eric Dean. I think that remember his name. That Joanna, please help me. Was Eric Dean? I think was like four years old, and he was murdered at the hands of his mother. After several reports, after several reports that were like ignored, in a little rural town in Minnesota, and eventually he was murdered. From that murder, there was an uproar. And at that time, Governor Dayton created a task force, a, uh, a task force on uh, child protection, which included legislators. It included, you know, uh, community members, uh, child protection workers, advocates for children, you know. And because the act was so egregious, the consequences of what happened, you know, from that task force that was done, you know, with all the, the with all the guidance and all the intentions to working to ensure that we were keeping kids safe, caused an uproar that child protection workers, social workers, and others became very sensitive that maybe under my watch something would happen to another child. And we had a funnel of kids coming into the system just coming into the system in high numbers, overburdening the systems, overburdening child protection systems, um, just uh, uh, overburden or whether or not we was moving too many kids too rapidly, not placing them with kids, not keeping them in their community, not keeping them connected to their schools. But all that was done on behalf of children, right? Because we want to keep children safe. And so here we are. We have foster parents who was like, these kids are coming in with too much trauma. They're coming in with too many issues. I don't know how, what to do or how to handle this. So we had a system that was overburdened from that decision-making process. And I'm not saying that anything was good or bad. I'm just saying we created a process that, that overwhelmed a system, a government system that we felt was going to do the best in the best interest of children and families. And so from that, we realized that there was lots of things that, that was happening. You know, we looked at, you know, uh, Joanna talked about uh, legal representation. I don't know any other systems where we have someone to go before a judge who the life is at the, uh, is, is um, uh, that we're going to make life decisions for that individual, whether they went into a store and they stole a candy bar to whether they committed a murder to anything in between that representation is given there. And one of the biggest life decisions that's been made when a parent's children has been removed from their home and we don't think that they should go before a judge with representation. And the system that is inundated with red tape is cumbersome, it's big, but we expect parents to go into that system by themselves. To defend themselves. Um, I don't know any other system that does that, but you guys are the lawyers, so if, if there is, then you let me know. So we're working on parent representation, that a parent should have representation when they go before a judge on something that is as is, is key as child removal. We looked at what I was able to pass, um, and I think in 2019, what we call a comfort call. When kids are removed from their homes, they're moved and they're not able to take a blanket with them. They're not able to take a favorite toy. They don't know where their parents and their mother and fathers are. They are sent and put, in, they are sent and put into a home with strangers that they know nothing about. 
You know, we have a system that's a deficit based system that believes that the parents is wrong and the foster parents that believe I'm here to, you know, to take care of the kids and save the kids from those bad people. And they never talk to each other. Right. To find out, does this child have an allergy? Does they have a teddy bear that would stop them in the middle of night from crying? You know, that maybe they can, you know, if the parent hasn't done anything egregious, because we don't want to re-traumatize the child, neither something egregious has happened with that parent, that maybe they can have a simple phone call within the first 48, 72 hours to find out how to, what to do in the best interest of the child. Now we're moving into the 21st century now, right? Where we're not just seeing bad, 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 but what are we doing in the best interest of the child? Move that bill. We, we And Joanna talked about, you know, the foster care bill where we are aligning um, foster care licensing with a, adoption standards. We just aligning those two. Why is the, the standards for foster care is more rigorous than someone who's going to adopt the child? Why? Why is that so? And in the midst of all that, which is why this is you know also very important to me as a legislator that we are creating laws and policies that are fair and just, is that we know that disproportionately that more black children were coming into the system than white parents. That often and sometimes, sometimes and often that children were being removed from black homes and put into foster care and white children and were allowing, we were allowing white children to the white parents to get parent support and children are, are, were remaining in those homes for the same type of initiatives. So that inequities was clearly been seen within our system where biases and stuff like that were showing up in the decision-making process. And so um, those are, and then, you know, we was able to create a process and I carried a bill that allowed parents to, when their child are lingering in foster care and have not been adopted, that a parent can petition the court for the reestablishment of parental rights, right? We should never want our kids to age out of foster care. If our parents have renewed themselves, that they they are they are healthy, they're strong, they have a job, they have a home, they have a foundation, where well, that child can go back into that home, right, and reconnect with their family. And so, you know, the previous piece was that only a county attorney could do that, could petition the court. You know, county attorneys don't do that. That's not their role. They have never done that. That is not their role. And so we create a process where parents can now petition the, uh, the courts to reestablish their parental rights and get their parental rights back. So those are some of the things that, as a legislator, that um, I have been able to do in partnership with others, because none of us can do this thing by ourselves. And the stories that I know that we hear as legislators are powerful, they are impactful when it comes from those who have been impacted by the system. It is powerful when we get to hear the stories of others about the system that we have created and the laws and policies that are in place that create unnecessary barriers, but also when we can create an opportunity to do better. And we can always do better when we know better, right? And sometimes we just don't know. We, you know, we do things thinking we're doing it in, you know, in the best interest of something. And so uh, I'm going to stop there. I don't know how long I've been talking, but uh, that has been my experience. Uh, it's a little bit about the history of what has placed me in this process of caring around, of caring about child protection and our child welfare system and to do my work and to create laws and policies that are done through a strength-based lens that really creates healthy children, healthy communities, and also a healthy system. Thank you, Representative Moran, for being here. Um, Max, do you want to talk a little bit about your work um, and maybe your work on the foster care bill in terms of some of the challenges that um, we encountered? And then I may just wrap up and open it up to questions uh, after that at some point. Sure thing. Thanks, Joanna. And um, you know, as Representative Moran pointed out, we all come to this work through different paths. And, you know, 
my work um, on the you know changing of foster care licensing standards um, started off when I first started lobbying for the Hennepin County Attorney's Office at the Capitol. One project that we were working on internally um, from the County Attorney's Office was a pilot program to try to change foster care licensing standards for relatives to address some of the racial disparities we were seeing. We were told that we wouldn't get uh, 4E funds uh, reimbursed if from the from the federal government if we made you know a special category of statute. So we kind of abandoned that. But at that same time, Joanna, uh, woman uh, presenting today, uh, took up the mantle and you know <laughs> took the initiative to gather. Um, I think who she thought at the time was you know everyone who would be uh, concerned about this legislation, and I think. Um, and so as the lobbyist for the office um, and someone who was interested in this area, um, I attended all of those and worked and brought in partners from the statewide Minnesota County Attorneys Association, who um, all of us were really skeptical at the beginning about, you know, how are we going to, you know, safely change these laws and, you know, get them properly aligned. And um, I think all of us moved a little bit at some point on, you know, what the legislation should look like. And that's kind of, uh, it can be the, uh, a good process sometimes. Um, and sometimes it, it, it's a matter of compromise, which, you know, is something that I think all of us have learned along the way is the only way that legislation, um, especially, you know, kind of transformational legislation like this gets passed compromise. Um, I, I would note that I, I mentioned that Joanna brought everyone in who she thought would be concerned about this because it became that that was four years ago when she started this work um, and took that initiative. And I feel like every year there was a new group that popped up that said, wait, 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 what about this? Uh, you know, we're, we're not on board with this. And then, um, you know, finally, I feel like we're at that point where uh you know, people are on board. But if you start building those coalitions, even in just like a small um, way with your like-minded partners, and then try to get someone, um, you know, along the way who is sympathetic to your viewpoint, but, you know, maybe doesn't even have a lot of power within their organization, just engage them in conversations and don't be afraid to in fact, not don't be afraid to go outside of your initial network, but you really have to try to bring people along who look at this differently with you. And it's challenging and it often takes multiple years uh, is what I've learned. Yep. Thank you. Um, so I would, I, I really appreciate hearing from both Representative Moran um, and Max. And it it is true that um, there's so many different phases of the process that I feel like are challenging. And so I would also point out that the, the idea of finding people to work together is necessary because you need sort of like across the political spectrum support of something at the legislature, but you also need people who are able to talk to strong opponents of the bill. So you need to build bridges with individuals who maybe have more credibility with opponents than you might. Um, and I guess I would just say, you know, anecdotally that um, the first two years of working on the foster care licensing bill, um, we were not even basically given a hearing in the um, in the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, which is controlled by one individual in our Senate, um, one senator. And it, it became clear that the only way this bill was going to go through is if we could get someone to change his mind about hearing our bill. And so the, the goal then switched from, you know, worrying about what the bill said so much and then moving into like, you know, the psychology of getting into this person's, you know, being able to like work with this person. And so there's just so many moving parts around how things actually go forward. And I would say from my perspective, like, I am not someone who is particularly adept at talking to people. I, I don't think I was at people who, you know, d didn't necessarily share my values and beliefs. And that is something I, ha I have definitely improved upon and sort of am really now committed to, you know, starting that conversation with like the points on the Venn diagram that you just, or I'm sorry, that you agree with, because they're all, there always are some, you can always find those, those places in the world where you can come together. Um, and I think we've, we've navigated this, um, 
through a variety of years um, to a position now where we have strong Republican support in the Senate for this bill. And that has taken a lot of work. That has taken some compromise. Um, you know, we've always had a champion in the House with this bill um, with Representative Moran, and our House has never been an issue. They've strongly supported this effort from year one. But it has taken a significant amount of work to, to make this come through the Minnesota Senate. Um, so, whoa. Sorry, I just popped away for a second. Um, I guess the only other thing I, I'd like to say before we open it up for some discussion, and I hope we can have some discussion and questions coming in um, from the chat. And, and when I talk about discussion, I mean like, what are issues you're working on? What questions do you have for us about how we did this? Are there things that are concerning in your jurisdiction that we could help talk through about? Do you have questions for us about how to get started. I mean, so I would really like to hear from individuals about issues in your jurisdiction or ways that we can provide additional information. Um, and I guess, um, I don't know if there's like, if people, can people ask questions? Wait, let me look and see if there's questions. Hold on, there's mm -hmm. questions. Yes. Can I just oh. do one thing, Joanna, real quick on, yes. on that last point? Yes, uh, and it addresses a question that I believe uh, Mary Day put in the chat about struggling to find a legislative partner. Um, beyond finding people that disagree with you, one thing I've observed in my last few years of lobbying is that um, you can be the most passionate person, the most well-researched, and give the best presentation. Um, but if you don't have a champion uh, elected official who will really take on um, your cause as their cause and, and bring ownership to it, um, which Representative Moran did with this bill. Um, th there's no really good substitute for a legislator who is committed to getting something passed because they're the ones that have communication with the leadership of the legislative bodies. And um, I, I think uh, more than anything, you know, getting them invested um, and finding those good partners is, um, you know, a, a, is as good a first step as you can make. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Max. I, I think what is them, you definitely, if you're gonna change laws and policies to practice and behaviors and thought processes, you know, you really have to, you, you have to find a legislative champion to do that. And I was always say, start with your legislator. And sometimes it's just educating legislators. Sometimes it's not even on the radar. They don't know anything about it. You know, they haven't heard. So that initial conversation that, you you know have with your you know representative your your senators you know I, I haven't found anyone whether they're republicans or democrats who do not care about children right we may have a different perspective about what that looks like and what the solutions are but it's a really really good place to start and then within that meeting you say to them you know do you know is there anyone else that you know is leading on this subject area or that care about this area and then try to find yourself or someone else who, if they don't represent you, to also hold a meeting with them to begin this uh, conversation. Because a lot of times it's just about educating us about the issues that are, are impacting, you know, people back in the community um, that is having like really life impacts. And so just to start there for myself, you know, uh, we've come a long way from where we were when I first came into the legislature in 20, uh, 2010. Um, after the governor created the legislative task force on uh, child protection, well, it wasn't a legislative, it was like more of a, uh, a body of folks came together. We in the legislature stepped up and created a legislative task force on child protection. And so I, along with myself, led that in 2019, 2020 with a senator who also, so we was co-leading that task force together. And we didn't always see um, the, the the solutions the same, but it's, it was the, the, um, the relationship building that had to happen, but also the sharing of information and, and the knowledge of what was happening, whether it was urban or rural, and then find those commonalities. So, um, and it takes, sometimes it doesn't happen, uh, Joanne, right? The, the Joanna, the first time around. Um, sometimes it takes, you know, two, three, four years in the wheel from, for that shift to happen, right? Because we have for so long looked at this issue really through a deficit-based type of system. 
Um, and so changing that shift from, you know, a more of, of a, uh, a supportive lens or giving parents the tools they need to be the best parent that they can be and have a system that can validate that and see some value in that um, doesn't always happen quickly or easily. I think I agree with all of that. I would say just from like a music getting started perspective, um, you know, it, there's a lot of different ways to do that. I mean, some of the work that we did around the foster care issue was literally, I was like, our law is not working. And so I had a pretty concrete idea of what I wanted to do. And, um, but w what I have tended to do as a strategy, as, as a starting point is to bring together in like a working group setting individuals I think would be concerned about an issue and ask people to come and meet to talk about potential reform. And I tend to start with a really big group. And then over time, people can decide if their voice wants to stay there, if they want to delegate it, if they want to bounce out. And so that group tends to narrow. Um, I think you also need to develop good communication strategies. So like setting up lists and ways to communicate with individuals about what's going on. Um, but I think simply like inviting a group of stakeholders together to talk about an issue you're seeing and see if people have an interest in working towards some legislative reform is a really good place to start. Um, so if there's like concrete problems you're seeing, like that's a great way to start. Um, here's the problem, talking to people about solutions. Um, and I think that Representative Moran is exactly right. I mean, meeting with your individual legislator or asking your legislator who else is involved that I should talk to. And I think the more, the more times that you are able to show up and to have a conversation, and it might be a seven minute conversation and then an 11 minute conversation, it's like mm -hmm. people are very busy, but um, those are two first steps that I think would are really um, important. Are there other questions or thoughts? So can I just say that, you know, um, and I did say that I was working with community members, but really when you have like strong allies like Joanna who have brought together stakeholders, you know, and not all of them was aligned on right together on what the uh, solution was, but that those engagement, those meetings, that type of leadership where you can get a collective of people coming together around a co common solution was like really helpful for me back in the inside, right, with other lawmakers. Because it was through that leadership that we began to have those many, many conversations from like Joanna and her, and her group about how we can move forward. I mean, to have her and the county attorneys come together, I mean, that's that's powerful, right? And so um, I agree, you know, just finding those allies and just beginning with those conversations about, you know, what did that look like, you know, in, in changing laws and, and policies and practices. Britt had a question uh, in there, do we focus on just one issue or the big picture? And that's a really, because there are a lot of legislative issues at every level all the time. And I, one of the observations I was going to make was um, the foster care licensing bill work, which we started four years ago, really started off just as that was the main focus of like the group of people that Joanna had collected. Now that we've worked, you know, for four years on that, um, the same group of people is able to be tapped for, you know, when Joanna has the next idea for, you know, transforming, um, you know, what the child welfare system looks like. And so by especially getting that first one done or, you know, making progress with one issue area, it, you have like a base of people that you can go to. And even if, you know, uh, you know, our office had some concerns on some of those other issues, we're talking and engaged in a productive manner rather than, you know, a, a, a combative one. Um, so. I think in terms of like the one issue or the multiple issues, um, I mean, I have like, you know, I have like a list of like 200 statutory changes I'd love to see in Minnesota, right? So like, you know, I could do this for the rest of my life, <laughs> but that's just me. And it's like, I don't know if other people agree. I don't know if they're the best idea. So. You have to be strategic. Um, and I think that it's like, 
So for example, we have, um, we have a statute in Minnesota right now that like, if you if you're on our predatory offender registry, you you know you automatically a petition to terminate your parental rights if you have a child is automatically filed basically, and it's it's a policy that's inconsistent around the state, and it's created a lot of confusion in county attorneys offices. I think some county attorneys offices just think it's a good idea, others don't. Um, but like that issue is creating a lot of problems around the state and prior to this session i was having a lot of conversations and it's like it just became clear that that was going to be a really heavy lift and i was like i don't think that we're going to take that on right now like that's going to be something for a future year or maybe something that we just don't do um even though it's something that i feel like is really critical so it is sort of like reading the landscape right like where are you going to be mm -hmm. able to build consensus and after i've had like five or six conversations with people were like that is a full stop no go i'm like okay that's not happening right now like there's also a sense of like i don't know if there's more things you want to do can you move on to something else um but our institute is really committed to issues that directly impact communities of color and address system disparities and so that guides the work that we do from the from the forefront that's that's what drives our um our work and so there's a lot of different things i think that could come under that umbrella like looking at some of the requirements in minnesota around mandatory reporting i like what diane has said we're definitely thinking about neglect i feel like neglect is defined mm -hmm. so broadly mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i know federally people are looking yeah. at that i'm definitely interested in looking at that in minnesota um and then, I mean, some of the other things I think that that are idiosyncratic about our state that you may find is that we have a state administered county run system. So we have a ton of conflict between the Department of Human Services, the statewide administrative agency and all 87 counties. Right. And so when you try to step into the policy arena, you're also stepping into some other people's fights that you have no idea about. But all of a sudden you're in the middle of a is this a state thing is this a county thing and so it's good to just have like in addition it's just good to have people you can talk to to get a straight answer about what's going on and to establish some sort of like leadership networks or people that you trust that can give you like the you know a true sense of what's really going on um so i th those are comments that i have too i don't know if there's other questions that have come in Another idea of uh, the, there was a question about, you know, where do I start? Because it can be a daunting, you know, uh, picture to look at. Um, but, you know, one thing you can do is print out your statute, start crossing out the sections you don't want and writing, you know, actually putting words down to paper what you think the statute should say. Um, if your state is like Minnesota, then you can work with, um, you know, the staff at the Capitol. Um, that will also provide, you know, uh, really helpful technical assistance. I, I don't think we, any of us would be where we are right now uh, with this bill or any of the other stuff we've worked on without helpful staff from, you know, the, the, the revisor's office. Um, but there, but, you know, before, if, if it is too daunting to go out and gather a big group of people, you can start by, you know, rewriting the law just on your own and, like all, all credit to Joanna, who's who took the first crack at it from you know the first chance because it's a big sprawling statute that we're trying to change. And at some point, you know, we can all. It's easy to get a group of people who think that something should change and get them together in the room and then complain about all these things <laughs> and and then never like actually do the work of like you, you know because you do some of the work and then oh you run into an issue so you need to like add new language or change language mm -hmm. and that that doesn't happen unless someone sits down at some point and, and starts typing things out so i would like to say that is true so once joanne uh, joanna did all the hard work of uh, you know bringing language putting it on paper getting people around you know to have this conversation about it you know once that's all done i can like carry the veal right i can carry it but the, the advocacy there the testifiers are there maybe some research and some data all those things have happened that uh, coming from like you guys out there 
that is really, you know, bringing in those voices and those solutions from the community into that legislative body. Um, so you need, you, you definitely need that partnership. Um, community need a partnership. You as an individual need a partner with legislators, but also legislators really need you also. I think that's true. I just saw Britt's question. Um, I mean, one of the things that that I also think is important when you're getting into the policy world is like, as Max mentioned, I mean, so there's this overlay of federal requirements that states have to follow in order to get money that impact what can go in their statutes. And so there's some sense of like, um, we would love to do this, but then it's kind of like checking, like, is this even something we can do? Because what if ASFA says we have to in the states, you know, so, I think it's also sort of understanding the universe that you're in. And like along Britt's question, um, we've thought a lot about, we right now in Minnesota have a presumption of preference in our permanency outcomes. And so we prefer termination and adoption. Um, and I am very much planning to introduce a bill next year that takes away that preference to allow individual counties and county attorneys to make a decision about what permanency outcome makes the most sense in any given case. But I mean, one other thing I would point out like that's been really critical for us is data. And so it's like trying to understand the scope of the problem is something that's really important. So like, is this a problem that's affecting a lot of people? How many people are impacted? Mm -hmm. Is it impacting certain kinds of people more directly? And um, we just finished up like this great mapping of the whole state of Minnesota. And we're looking at what permanency outcome happens in each individual county. And we're mapping that. So we're like, where in Minnesota are they just doing a ton of terminations versus where are they doing more transfers of custody versus where are they returning kids more often? And starting to get some statewide trends to really be able to show people around the state, like, look, the way our law is right now is providing a really inconsistent remedy and outcome for families. Like if your kid gets removed here, something different happens, you know, and so I, I would just echo as you get started, Britt, or like thinking about it, that gathering data is really important. And one way we do that is we work directly with the Minnesota Judicial Branch and DHS. And we have like contacts now at both of those agencies who help us generate and synthesize data so that we can make sure that we're accurately, you know, to the extent we can get good data. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation, but data is really important too, right? To be able to support what you're saying in terms of the scope and context of what's happening. Max, this might be the first you're hearing about the presumption bill. <laughs> it's coming, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we can partner, we'll see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't really have any other any other thoughts or questions? Um, if there aren't any, I'll, I'll make sure that I put my name in the chat and my contact information. Um, and I'm I'm thankful that everyone came today. Um, if there are other questions, let us know in the last few minutes because that's what we're here for to really try to help you guys think through um, what could happen, um, you know, in your state as you think about trying to do this. But sometimes those thoughts happen not at the exact same time that the presentation's happening, so please feel free to reach out anytime. I want to just take a minute also to thank um, Representative Moran and, um, and Max and say that um, I'm so grateful for their partnership and the great work that they're doing on these issues in Minnesota and um, I think that establishing relationships with people is such a key part of this whole practice, right? Like with your client, with, with the court, with everyone. And, and that is, that is absolutely true in the policy world too. Um, so I wish all of you here, um, and Diane also is a great resource. She's been posting in the chat. She's incredible. Mm -hmm. So she also is someone that you could reach out to, um, with a ton of questions. She's just a wealth of knowledge as well. 
Um, do you know if there are any attacks on the disparity in Title IV funds that is biased against the support for parents? Um, Mary, can you, I don't know if we can get her voice on, um, or maybe Max or Representative Moran, I don't know. So um, there's, um, I don't, what question was you answering? So I Mary mean, has a question. Um, do you oh, do, do you know if there's any attacks on the disparity in the Title IV funding that is biased against support for the parents? Well, so I mean, one, so I generally speaking in Title IV, a, I don't know. I would say that, you know, a couple years ago, there was a shift in Title IV e funding to include um, parent representation as something that was reimbursable. So that's been a huge plus for parent representation. Um, and the first time that the Children's Bureau and Title IV E has directly been applied to fund training and parent representation across the country. So um, if you have other questions, Mary, please email me about Title IV E because I'd be happy to help. And I think the Family Preservation Act that we're funding, we moved here, is going to also support a lot of that Title IV E dollars. And to chase uh, around funding, increased funding for the uh, public defender, our, judici our judiciary chair, uh, Chair Becca Fan, is definitely working on putting more funding into the public defender's office. So that is moving through the body right now. Um, yes, thank you, Representative Moran. Yes. Iqua, great. So for all these questions coming in, feel free to reach out to me online. Um, there's a there's a lot of work going on in terms of ICWA around the country. Um, I think that, I mean, so, and just to add Chase to what Representative Moran said, I mean, the public defender's office in Minnesota right now doesn't provide representation for parents. And so we have not been advocating for more funding to go to the public defender's office. Um, because that's not really a part of the people who are getting money for this bill. But generally speaking, um, it's massively underfunded, just like many are around the country. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that that, you know, is is constantly on the radar of the legislature in Minnesota. OK, I think that's it. Thanks so much for your questions and time today, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Representative Moran. I look yes. forward to seeing you guys soon. Thank you, Joanna. Take care.